to 2 Timothy in chapter number 1. Second Timothy chapter 1, verses 5, 6, and verse number 7. And for a moment, I want to talk from this subject. It all starts at home. All of it, all of it starts at home. When I call to remembrance the unfeigned faith that is in thee, which dwelt first in thy grandmother Lois and thy mother Eunice, and I am persuaded that in thee also, Wherefore, I put thee in remembrance that thou stir up the gift of God, which is in thee by the putting on of my hands. Verse 7 reads, For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Thank you. You may have your seats. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God shall stand forever. There is a sickening pathology that has taken hold in our communities. That was not the way it always was. There's almost a hopelessness. A sick kind of foolishness that has engulfed our communities. But I, I, can't, I can't hold it any longer. I have not moved out of the community. And I'm not, I'm not at nobody. I'm not after anybody. You live wherever you want to live. You, you do whatever you want to do. Whatever your money can help you do, that's what you do. But I'm talking about where I live. And what I see on a daily basis makes me want to pack up and go meet you. These young people are crazy. Who, who is raising these children? Seven-year-old girls look like women. How do you expect her not to look for a man when she's seven years old dressing like a woman? I wish they had a witness here. It's sickening to look at television, the news, these break-ins and stabbings at Spring High School. And young girls being abducted and young boys being sexually assaulted. There is no control. There's seemingly no help for these sickening pathologies in our community. Bum Quisha walks the street all night long. That's the stupid names they're giving these children. (laughs) 
Ray Ray's pants is hanging down his butt. And then the children who are being raised in good homes cannot communicate because they don't pick their face up from their video games, Instagramming, tweeting and texting. It all starts at home. I'm, I'm, I've come to the age where I can say this. But I remember when pot was something you cooked in. Crack was a hole in the wall. Tweeting was something a bird did. And a rock was something you threw in somebody's window. But we are dragging our communities down because wherever we move in, we turn it into a ghetto. It does not have to be the best to be clean, to pick up the trash in the ditch, to be respectful to our women and to our elders by saying yes ma'am and no ma'am Thank you, and I appreciate it. These children are crazy because it starts in the home. You might as well come on and get with me because it ain't going to get no better. Mamas are trying to be their daughter's friends. And fathers are trying to be as young as their children. And there is no structure in the home. So consequently, they have a problem teaching them at school. Because they do not behave properly in their homes. They are not taught respect in their homes. They are not taught table manners in their homes. It's so bad that some restaurants don't even want children in there. Some airlines would rather not have your ticket money than to have your bad children flying on their plane. It starts in the home. Our parents were not afraid of us. Somebody ought to help me preach it. They did not hesitate to discipline us. The Bible says if you whip him, it's not going to kill him. The Bible says foolishness is bound up in him, but the rod of correction will drive it far from him. There's some, there's some ridiculous study that I heard on the news uh, that you ought not yell at your children because yelling is just as bad as spanking. And you don't want to damage their self-esteem. And so you allow these little devils to take over your house that people hate to go and visit you because of your impotent children, your ill-mannered offspring. Talk back to me if you can. This recklessness that has happened in our community has not always been that way. Something has happened to us to turn us like the larger culture because there was some constraint in our communities and in our schools and in our churches because the teachers went to church with the same people they taught every day. 
And when they got through correcting you at school, they'd bring you home and tell your mama, and she would correct you right in front of the teacher. But now you cussing out the principal and cussing out the teachers and marching at, at the schoolhouse and, and marching to the committee meetings. Why don't you march? Because they can't read. Why don't you march that they're too ignorant to write? We, we react to the wrong stuff. You, you got to catch him before he stabs somebody. You got to catch him before he breaks in somebody's house. You got to catch him before he rapes somebody because it starts in the home. It, it, it's right here in the text. I'm not making it up. It's right here in the text. Paul said, when I call to remembrance the unfeigned faith that is in you. Talking to his young understudy, Timothy. Now, Timothy's father is Greek. Philip of Macedon. I wish I had a Bible reader. But his grandmother and his mother are Jews. And their Greek father did not object to their mother and grandmother teaching him the scriptures. And you ought to have a man in your life who do not object to you teaching your children the ways of God. Get rid of that man who doesn't go to church, who doesn't read the Bible, who doesn't love God, who doesn't treat you like a woman ought to be treated. It starts in the home. A boy learns how to treat a woman by watching how his daddy treats his mama. And I'm finna get in trouble right here. I'm finna mess up right here. Woman, let that daddy chastise his children. He's not going to kill them. He's trying to raise them. Get out of the way and let that man teach that boy how to be a man. And, and then the problem, the problem is compounded when there is no man in the house. Because then, woman, you try to turn your boy into your little man. He becomes a surrogate husband. And you love him so much that if he ever gets a wife, he's got to divorce his mother so he can marry his wife. Because you are always in those children's business trying to be his wife when you did your job as a mother now go sit down did you get that let me say it again did your job as a mother the daddy wasn't there you did the best you could go sit down and let him try to be a husband to his wife oh, I wish I had my 730 crowd you're trying to turn him into your little man. And then he's in the bed while you go get his oil changed. You go get his car inspected. Help me preach if you can. You fill out the job application. You call in when he's sick. He's tired. He don't feel like getting up. He worked all night. He's sick. He's tired. He, he can't kill himself. That's my baby. No, he's not. He's a man with responsibility. Talk back to me if you can. And until a man emotionally detaches from his mother's apron strings, he'll never be good enough to take a wife. Because a real woman wants a real man 
And a real man goes to work. A real man takes care of his children. A real man does not have to be sued by the attorney general to take care of his responsibility. A real man will not walk out on his wife for another woman. A real man will stay in the house and demand respect. Husbands, love your wife. Wives, see to it that you respect your husband as the Lord. It got kind of chilly right there. See, that's a, that's, that's a new kind of thing happening now. That, that they don't hardly want me to marry them anymore. Because they don't like the way I do it. Uh, they, they don't like my gospel. Uh, what, what is this stuff for you marrying and keeping your own last name? You, you got a husband. You respect your husband. Talk back to me if you can. You, you no longer your daddy's daughter. You are your husband's wife. See how quiet y'all got right in the center here? Because you want to be your own woman. You can't be your own woman in the house with a real man. Am I doing all right? A real man knows how to take care of a woman. Uh, my daughter, my daughter said, Daddy, I don't know if I could ever marry a man like you. She said, you, you're too bossy. You're a male chauvinist. <laughs> I said, a male chauvinist will boss you, but it'll take care of you. Yeah. The lights won't be turned off. Yeah. You can buy whatever you want to buy. You can drive whatever you want to drive. Because a real man who's a male chauvinist makes sure that his wife has no responsibility but to take care of her husband. Sister, y'all should be shouting right there. <laughs> Philip would not stop Lois and Eunice from training Timothy in the ways of God. That, that word unfeigned. I, 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 when I call to remembrance the unfeigned faith that is in you. Paul is saying, I call to remembrance a faith that is void of hypocrisy. Paul is too old a preacher to be fooled by a young preacher like Timothy. And listen, when you've been in the church a while, it's hard for somebody to fool you. When your faith is real, it's easy for you to pick up when somebody's faith is false. Have I got a witness here? People who are false and phony and Johnny come late they can't preach to you because they are not strong enough in their faith to tell you what thus saith the Lord and you can pick it up because you have an unfeigned faith. A faith that is absent hypocrisy. A faith that has gotten you through the darkest night. A faith that has helped you when the rug has been pulled out from under you. A faith that has sustained you when life has turned on you. And anybody who comes preaching to you without that kind of faith, you can pick it up right away. That's the kind of faith Lois had. That's the kind of faith Eunice had. And that's the kind of faith Lois and Eunice, the grandmother and the mother, put in young Timothy. Paul said, I know it's in you because I pastored your grandmother. 
Somebody ought to help me preach here. I used to preach to your mother. And I watched them move about in their faith. And what was in them, they put in you. Somebody ought to help me as I hurry. It's hard for you to get away from how you've been raised. I need two or three more witnesses to help me preach right here. When, what, what those old people put in you when you were growing up as a girl and a boy, it's hard for you to get away from that. It's hard for you to get away from church the way you know church ought to be done. Y- y'all can have this new stuff. Y'all can have all this jumping around and cutting up. There's this new church where you got to have a praise team to get you excited. And you got to have a praise leader to tell you give God a hand to praise. I don't need all of that. When I think about where God brought me from, how I was raised to love the Lord, how I was raised to come to church and listen to preaching and appreciate what God had done for me, I don't need nobody to tell me to get excited about the Lord. I get excited when I think about what he's done for me. We are grandparents. Ain't got no business raising children. Because you're too tired. You can't, you can't jump on them when you need to jump on them. Come on, help me preach if you can. You, you, you don't have the energy you had in your 20s, in your 30s. Babies are for young people. Grandparents take them and spoil them and buy them everything they want and let them eat candy and let them eat sweets and let them stay up till 1130 at night and and let them watch all the TV they want and let them play with your car keys and let them run around the house and just let them jump in the bed. That's what grandparents are supposed to do. Let them wear your shoes. Let them go in the refrigerator and eat all the popsicles they want. Let them jump in the bed. Let them jump in the sofa. Just so they don't kill themselves, let them do whatever they want. That's the grandparents' job. But it's the parents' job to train them, to raise them in the ways of godliness, and then put in them grandparents, because sometimes the mom and dad is not doing it, so the grandparents got to put in them how to love Jesus. Because your daughter's in the street and somebody's got to train these children. Your son is in the pen or he's on crack or he's holding another man's hand somewhere on the down low. Talk back to me if you can. And so somebody got to tell him there's a way that seems right. Have I got a witness? Somebody got to tell him that the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. Somebody's got to tell him, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Somebody's got to tell him, if my people who are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked way. Then will I hear from heaven. Forgive their sins. Heal their land. That's unfeigned. Faith that is absent hypocrisy. But now, look at the roots of that kind of faith. We've seen the reality of it. It's unfeigned. Let's look at the roots of it. That kind of strong faith has got to come from somewhere. You don't just wake up in the morning and have that kind of faith. No, you need some old person who's been through something. Somebody ought to help me preach right here. I I, I, I used to love to hang around my grandmother to hear her talking about her childhood days, to hear her giving me sage advice, wisdom from her many years of experience. 
Young people need to be around old people who got good sense. I try to say to the folk who were here this morning that wisdom does not always come with age. Have I got a witness? Because there are plenty of old fools around. But you need to get with some senior man, some senior woman who has seen God do some wondrous works. They've watched God work miracles. They've watched God open doors. They've watched God make a way. And that's encouragement to young people to know that you don't have to walk through life by yourself. That's a, that's a root system that goes with that kind of faith. Lois and Eunice are the root system for Timothy's faith. It, it grew up in them. And so it grew up in him. Because you know as well as I, there was more that we caught than we were taught. They didn't, they didn't sit down with us and tell us everything. We just watched them. Somebody ought to help me here. They didn't always talk to us about the faith. We just watched them getting ready on Friday for church on Sunday morning. I knew my grandmother wasn't going to church if she didn't have her clothes out Friday afternoon. Uh, that's the way old folks are. They got to, it take them a while to get themselves together. She would put all her stuff out on the bed. Shoes and stockings and everything. That's another thing. Where does this stuff start when y'all don't wear no stockings to church? <laughs> I, just, I just slipped that in. You ain't going to no joke joint. You ain't going to no nightclub. Dress yourself like you going to church. Look like you coming to the Lord's house. You could tell people who were Christian by how they dressed. Oh, this is hard to listen to, ain't it? They look like church women. They look like deacons. They looked like men who went to church and the community respected them. I could tell my grandmother wasn't going to church when she didn't have all her stuff out because they prepared to get to church on Sunday morning. And then when they got to church, they didn't care who was preaching. They didn't care what choir was in the choir loft. They didn't care who was ushering on the floor. They'd been through it all the week. They'd been called boy and gal. They were janitors and cooks. They were domestics and chauffeurs from Monday through Saturday. But on Sunday morning, something happened to them. Somebody ought to help me preach right here. I, I ate in many of their homes, many of the old people in my growing up years. Their wallpaper was newspaper. They didn't have a whole lot of what the world calls success. But they said, over my head, I hear music in the air. There must be a God somewhere. They came to church on purpose to shout and praise God. Some of y'all been sitting in here since 11 o'clock. You haven't bowed your head, you haven't closed your eyes, you haven't clapped your hands, you haven't told the Lord thank you because you're waiting for me to get you excited. Well, I was excited when I got up this morning. I woke up this morning. Somebody ought to help me. With my mind stayed on Jesus. And listen, if you were raised in the church, you would come home and pray like you heard them pray. Here I am. Knee bent and body already bowed. 
I wish I had somebody who was raised in church. I turned my face to the mother's dust. And when I rose this morning, I want to thank you for a reasonable portion of my health and strength. Thank you that the bed I laid in was not my cooling bowl. And the covers that I wrapped in was not my winding sheet. I want to thank you for my children. And then they started calling each one of their children by name. Somebody ought to help me here. And we'd come home and pray like Richard Walker and pray like Verdis Quinn and, and pray like Brother Godfrey. And then we would shout like Sister Devine Roper. Uh, we would run all around the church like Sister Annie Cross because we were playing church. But since I met Jesus and got in some trouble on my own and needed the Lord to come to my rescue, I'm not playing church anymore. I'm not acting like somebody else. I shout because of my own testimony. That's the reality. That's the roots. But I want to close with reinforcement. For God has not given us a spirit of fear. You're going to help me close this, won't you? But of power, of love, and a sound mind. I'm not crazy. I know who kept me. I'm not a fool. I know who brought me. And so when I come to church on Sunday morning, I don't care who I'm sitting next to. I got a story to tell. I need somebody to help me close here. I, I got something I want to say. And I'm going to say it if I got to say it by myself. God's been good to me. God has opened doors for me. God has made a way out of no way. And I love Jesus, and he loves me. And when I come to church on Sunday morning, I'm going to shout and lift my hands. I'm going to open my mouth and raise my voice because I got a story to tell. Have I got a witness here? God has brought me out of darkness and into his marvelous light. He's opened doors that were closed in my face. Somebody here can testify of your grandmother and your grandfather. Somebody in your growing up years helped you to be the woman and the man that you are right now. He said to Timothy, don't despise your youth. Let no man despise your youth. Stir up the gift that is in you. Because God has not given you a spirit of fear. And I think I ought to tell somebody in here who's embarrassed to be a witness. Somebody who's ashamed to let the world know that you're on the Lord's side. I feel sorry for you. Because I, am not, I don't have a spirit of fear. I thank God that I'm not ashamed of the gospel. For it is the power of God unto salvation. Is there anybody else here? No, you wouldn't be where you are right now if somebody didn't pray for you. Somebody didn't raise you to fear God. Somebody made you get up on Sunday morning. Even though you had been out all Saturday night. Somebody made you get up on Sunday morning and put your clothes on and make your way to the house of God. I wish I had a witness here. I told the people here who were at our earlier service, if you want to stay young a long time, put yourself in some young person. Deposit some of you in some young person. You need to tell these young people, you older women here, you older men here, tell these young people the truth. You remember what Cavassier used to taste like. You remember what Chevis Regal used to taste like. Come on, help me preach a minute. You know what happy hour is all about. As a matter of fact, you stayed at happy hour so long you got overjoyed about it. You would just be getting home on Sunday morning. 
but the Lord has delivered you from all of that. And just like you danced all night in the club, just like you partied and had a good time in the club, since God's been good to you, don't be embarrassed. Don't have a spirit of fear when it comes to giving God some praise. Is there anybody here not ashamed of the gospel? Is there anybody here knowing it was God who brought you out? If the Lord opened doors for you, help me praise his name. If the Lord delivered you from your past, help me magnify his name. If the Lord made a way for you, help me give him the glory. I don't have a spirit of fear, but I got a spirit of love, a spirit of power, and a spirit of a sound mind. I know who it was that brought me. I know who it was that kept me. If you know who brought you, and you're not ashamed to testify, if you know who kept you, and you don't care who's looking at you, if you know who opened a way for you, and you don't mind testifying, why don't you grab somebody, shake somebody's hand, tell them it was nobody but Jesus. Nobody, 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 nobody. I know he's all right. It has its roots, its reality, its reinforcement in the word of God. Mama, daddy, put the word of God in your children. Make them sit down and listen to you tell them it was nobody but the Lord. You know, when, when, when they go in the room and turn those lights on, somebody had to pay for that. When they get in that car and they got gas in it, somebody had to pay for that. When they open that refrigerator, both sides, looking in and can't decide what they want, somebody had to pay for that. And it was God who provided and don't be scared to tell them it was nobody but the Lord he's keeping you he's sustaining you and you ought to put that faithfully in your children